If you're like me, you often have a hard time coming up with what to say at cocktail parties if you enjoy parties and or cocktails. I got one for you. Here, try this. Try, try this on at your next party. Got to have a cocktail. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, hey, yeah. Um, did you know that sometimes hippos poop so much that fish die in the rivers? <laughs> Yeah, no, I know you asked me what I did, but I, <laughs> I deflected. <laughs> Much like hippos deflect their own feces with their tails in a helicopterian fashion. <laughs> and they spin their tails around and their poop flies everywhere. Oh, what? Oh, you're leaving? <laughs> okay. Mmm. What's that, vermouth? No, but, uh, but seriously, since you're still listening in here and you're in my captive audience, sometimes hippos poop too much in the water. Scientists visiting Africa, they were studying the uh, oxygen concentration in African rivers, and they discovered that sometimes there's so many hippos congregated in, in a single stream, a single river upstream, that when they defecate, which they do constantly and consistently, there's so much plant and organic matter in their feces that the bacteria in the water use up so much oxygen to break down all this stuff in the water, so much dissolved oxygen, as we environmental engineers call it, that there's not enough oxygen for the fish downstream, and the fish choke and die and kind of drown, technically. Fish can't just breathe in any old water. They need some level of dissolved oxygen, or DO, in the water. That's why if you have an aquarium or a goldfish, you need to aerate the water or provide new water, or else the fish will uh, choke in there because it doesn't have enough oxygen, just like it would if there was too much hippo poop. So so that's why aquariums need aerators, and that's also why uh, my, my first goldfish died. Anyway, what do you do? Finance. <laughs> Weird. Welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all your comments, questions, and corrections and address them to the degree at which they tickle my fancy, which, as it turns out, is not that ticklish. I'm hard to impress. Also, I give you a hint on what's coming up next on this channel. Uh, this week's hint is... Oh! Ah, magic hands. Oh, what's here? What's here? Nothing. Nothing up my sleeve. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> also, before we get into it, yes, as you may have noticed, I am feeling a little bit under the weather, but that's fine. We're gonna get through it. I released some microbes that I was looking into, and they got out, and I got it. <coughs> now I got something. Something drippy. Ah! <laughs> ah! Ah! The snorts! <laughs> they do nothing. <coughs> <laughs> but getting right to it, on the last episode of Because Science, I went back to our old tried and true series of you don't want X superpower like we did with super speed and super strength and visibility and so on. This time that you don't want the power of flight like a superhero, probably. <laughs> I made a lot of caveats to that, but we'll get to that. I said that if you think of the potential pros and cons of a superpower like flight as it is portrayed in pop culture, you might not want it. But what did you have to say? I knew this was going to be a controversial one, and there are thousands of comments at the time I am filming this video, so let's get right into it. Our first comment comes from Michael Breederland, who sounds like the antagonist of a YA novel. And they do some calculations to say that on average you might run into more birds than you are actually anticipating. And when you hit a bird, even as small as a robin, at a slow speed, it could still impart upwards of hundreds of newtons of force on you. And I checked their math, and yes, hitting a 19 grand robin at just 200 kilometers per hour would still impart 100 pounds of force on your face. So yes, birds, even if you're flying slow, low, and carefully, are still <laughs> something that you want to avoid. Oh. <laughs> Damn these bugs! That's, uh, microbes. I mean, if you were, yeah, I mean, even if you were flying around as slowly as someone like Batman would with his cape, just gliding, you'd still want to avoid a robin. Oh, bat nips. They go on to say, and birds wouldn't even be the only thing harassing you in the skies. Think of uh, drones, think of bugs, think of a dumb kid shining a laser pointer in your eyes at altitude. You know who you are. Don't do that. 
Our next comment comes from Pale Ghost 69 Nice. <laughs> Who says, uh, so I was curious as to how fast Superman can fly, <coughs> how fast Superman can fly. And uh, there was a nice breakdown saying that Superman can go 7.2 million miles per hour in the comics. Now, if you're going this fast, Pale Go 69, nice, goes on to say, wouldn't it burn off all your clothes and Superman would be flying through the atmosphere like a meteor trailing through it? And... <laughs> Yes, if Superman was traveling that fast through the atmosphere, he would compress the air in front of him so much that the leading edge of Superman would start to glow incandescent with how much heat it was building up. And even if he had super clothes that didn't immediately vaporize off of his body, nice. <laughs> It would still be a serious problem, which is why you, unaided, unlike Superman with his invulnerability, could not just fly at any old speed. You would either be so cold that you would want to go slow, or you'd be going so fast that you'd be burning up in the atmosphere like a meteor, and you do not want that to happen. Otherwise, you're going to be nake nake up there. Our next comment comes from a number of you who says, Oh, okay, Kyle. Even given all of the restrictions, I would still want to fly. It beats going through traffic. It beats dealing with the TSA. It beats a lot of things. Even a simple kind of power like levitation and not true flight would be great. So why don't I want it again? Uh... <clears throat> <clears throat> Look. I agree with you, a very tuned down version of flight would be pretty awesome, as I said in the video. If you were just slowly floating above the trees at, say, uh, car speeds, like 35 miles an hour, and you, you could bypass all of traffic, you wouldn't have to follow any roads, and you could just get to work or get to your friend's house, that would be awesome. But again, like I said in the video, this isn't really the version of super flight like we see in pop culture. It's not like you're Neo and crouching down and then blasting off into the upper atmosphere and you're there in just seconds. That's the superpower that I think you don't want and that's the one that I think is most common so that is what we are uh, restricting. But yeah, super levitation would be, you know, kind of cool. Oh, look at her go. All I'm saying is it would be a very cool power but you don't want it to be so cool that it gets cold. All right, 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 all right. <clears throat> I cough and sneeze into my shirt because it's even better than coughing into your... <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Still not great party conversation? Look, I'm just saying that if you have to sneeze anywhere, do it onto your own chest. <laughs> Want something from the bar? No? Done talking? Cool. Who else wants to know about poop? We got a lot of poop facts. <laughs> What's that? I should go? Cool, can I use your bathroom first? <laughs> Man, I'm a terrible party guest. Our next comment is kind of along the same lines. It comes from Cat the Kitty Cat, who says, reaction time, speed control, acceleration, and deceleration are all things we need to take into account. In most pop culture references, you launch from the ground and achieve your desired speed within mere seconds. Or the initial launch is a jump off the ground and usually a right angle burst where you're matching your desired speed. I think that we may find that accelerating to a couple hundred miles per hour in under a second would have serious negative connotations with both the possibility of blacking out or getting a concussion. And you're absolutely right. Have you ever been on a roller coaster that was going really fast and the edges of your vision started going black? I have because when you go really fast, really quick, you subject your body to intense G forces and you can experience G lock or G loss of consciousness, which would be bad if you were, you know, a kilometer above the surface of the planet. Kitty Cat has a very good point. If we want to take off and land like a superhero, not just fly, we'd have to endure the kinds of accelerations that they would, which would be even more dangerous than some of the stuff you're doing in the first place just while flying. So Kitty Cat, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Our next comment comes from Look Max, who says, I'm surprised bugs didn't get a mention. Even low and slow is a problem because you could end up with bugs smashed all over your face. No, I did not mention bugs, but bugs are everywhere, and it would be a serious problem if you've ever looked at the front of a car or the face shield of a motorcyclist after they're uh, making a long trip on the highway, for example. It's covered in bugs. If bugs aren't just a problem physically, like impacting them, which would hurt, kind of, probably, they would be a problem aerodynamically. I've seen reports that put the loss in fuel at millions of dollars for airlines. Do you know why? Because their wings, as they fly, get covered with a layer of bugs thick enough 
that it changes the aerodynamic properties of those wings and so they are less fuel efficient and they lose millions of dollars per year. Now just think about what that would do to you. Gross, inefficient, probably painful. Uh. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Pitar Sankov, who says, Hey Kyle, what if we wore pressurized suits and then flew to the upper atmosphere and got around all of the aerodynamic problems so that we are in uh, very rarefied air and can go even faster? Peter then goes on to describe the process. What if we were in a pressurized suit and then went at a very slow velocity, like 10 meters per second, up into the upper atmosphere so that we were out of bugs way and birds way and we didn't have to worry so much about aerodynamic heating or drag. Then we could go super, super fast, as fast as we wanted almost, and then we could travel anywhere in the world very, very quickly. Wouldn't that be awesome? I agree, Peter. This version does sound very cool, and it kind of sounds like the version of travel that people like Elon Musk want to do, where you get outside of the atmosphere, then travel really quickly to another side of the planet, and it takes like 30 minutes to get from Shanghai to New York, which would be amazing. But in my mind, we're adding a lot of stuff on just the basic superpower of super flight, which is unaided and unencumbered by extra gear and stuff like that. Think about it. Now we have to go really slow to get around all the problems in the lower atmosphere. We're wearing a pressurized heated suit so that we don't get too cold and so that we don't, you know, die. <laughs> and we're only flying at very high speeds when it is advantageous to do so. This is adding a lot, I think, to what needs to happen to make flight more believable. And at this point, we are just describing a rocket. And to me, if you're just describing a rocket, something that protects you, that gets you through the lower atmosphere very quickly and then goes fast in the upper atmosphere, we're getting further and further away from what pop culture shows us as possible. So, Peter, you are correct that that would be awesome and you could do something like this, getting around all of our caveats, but I think those caveats still mean you do not want the traditional power of flight. And Peter also says, P.S. I've been a big fan of the show for quite a while now and I've tried to be on Footnote several times. I hope this time might be the time. Ho ho! You did it! You are a super nerd! Ho Together this time. But of course, I'm not always right. Sometimes I'm sick. <clears throat> mm. Oh, there's nothing in here. So what did I get wrong last week? Our first correction comes from Ryan Alexander Bloom, who has a problem with the frostbite uh, caveat that I mentioned. I said that because of wind chill effects, if you go very, very fast where it's very, very cold, you can get frostbite on your tissue in just under two minutes. Now, Ryan points out that downhill skiers in very cold conditions going very fast, wearing just light protective gear, like a, a skin suit, are fine when they're traveling very quickly. And I see your point. If you want to go even further, skydivers don't have frostbite problems and they're falling for, you know, a minute or so through the atmosphere and they don't get as cold as I say. So what's going on, Kyle? <laughs> oh, right. What's going on is that I picked the worst case scenario for wind chill. So if you're going through the upper atmosphere where it's very cold, kilometers and kilometers above the ground, where it's like negative 50, negative 70 degrees Celsius out, and you're going very fast, like 100 kilometers per hour, then you are falling into the wind chill scenario. But as you are describing it, if you are going much slower, like 50 kilometers per hour, and you're near the ground, then wind chill is not a problem. It could lower uh, the ambient temperature outside from like 60 degrees Fahrenheit to like 53 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not that bad. But if you are going very fast, very high, like pop culture always shows, at least the pop culture that I've seen, then I think it could start becoming an issue, but it's probably not always that much of an issue, as you point out, Ryan, so good correction. Our next correction comes from Thwip Snick, who says, you completely left out drag force, but I got you, boo. Don't, don't talk to me like that. They go on to calculate just how much drag force you'd be experiencing if you're flying like a superhero at super speeds in the atmosphere. And they say, I could not find any real values for this, but they say uh, if your head wasn't oriented the right way, you could snap like a twig and your clothes would fly off and your shoes would constantly be flying off and your pants would be around your ankles. And yes, all of that would be supremely irritating. I don't think your neck is just gonna snap backwards, but having your shoes always fly off any time you take off in the air would be really annoying, especially if you have a big shoe budget as it is. And if you wanna see just how annoying it can be to fly in high velocity wind, go look up uh, the jackass guys when they put themselves behind the jet engine of an aircraft. 
even at relatively low speeds behind that gen engine, you can see, if you look up the video, how those boys are having such a hard time with keeping their clothes on and just moving around and being tossed around like a rag doll in this stream of high velocity air. So, whip snick, I think you're right. We are ignoring the drag forces, kind of like the Flash ignores drag forces, which would make super speed something else you don't want. Our next correction comes from Shinjiji, which means something in Mandarin that you can look up if you want to, uh, who says, on the matter of Iron Man, wouldn't he still be dead? I mean, smacking a bird would still cause impact if he smacked it head on. He'd probably break his neck, especially at the speed you see him going at, so a suit won't bail you out of bird death. In the episode, we roughly calculated that the average bird strike on something like a cruising 747 could impart 20,000 pounds of force on your face, and that would be very bad. Now, you are right. Because of Isaac Newton and equal and opposite forces, we know that if Iron Man hit a bird at similar speeds, he would encounter similar forces. He is still dealing with tens of thousands of pounds of force. Now, I said that Iron Man would do better than you just flying unaided because I'm assuming that his suit wouldn't yield the same way that an airplane fuselage would yield. It's probably a bit more robust given that it's Iron Man and he has some way to cushion impacts or else he's not gonna be doing any of the superhero stuff that we see Iron Man doing. So yes, you are exactly right. There's still the same amount of force on Iron Man, but I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt because he's Iron Man. Our next correction comes from Cookies Nibbler. <laughs> who says that at certain speeds, just breathing would become a problem because if you open your mouth, you'd be like a ramjet, just ramming air into your mouth and filling your lungs and exploding them, which would be bad. They go on to say that birds get around this problem, opening their mouth while they're flying and trying to breathe by having a very interesting respiratory system. It is a one-way flow system. So we humans breathe by inhaling air and then it stays in the same cavity and then we have to breathe it back out against the same air that's still kind of hanging around in there. So it's not as efficient. Birds, on the other hand, have a one-way flow system where they inhale, it goes into one chamber, and then they exhale, it goes into another chamber, and they inhale again, and the process repeats itself as the old air that they have used now and extracted the most oxygen possible in kind of like a counter current oxygen gas exchanger <gasps> exits their mouth and new air comes in. Birds need this kind of one-way flow system that is very efficient at getting oxygen into their body because flying is very metabolically uh, intense. It takes a lot of oxygen, a lot of fuel, so to speak, in their muscles just to maintain flight. But I don't know if opening your mouth and trying to breathe at relatively fast speeds would be that much of a problem. For example, skydivers are able to still breathe while they're skydiving, and they're going at terminal velocity for a human-shaped thing, uh, which is around 120 miles per hour. So you could still breathe at those velocities. And I couldn't really verify anything else that you were saying about birds dealing with the pressure difference when they're flying, because they are not going faster than 120 miles per hour. At least most birds aren't going that fast, except for like a peregrine falcon during a dive. And then are they breathing? Anyway, I see your point though. Breathing might become an issue. And just think about uh, all the air entering your eyes if you're not wearing goggles, running past your ears and feeling those pressure differences. I think it would be absolutely miserable. Something that I didn't say in the episode is think of how long you can just hang your head out of a car window on the highway if you ever did that as a kid. Think of how long you can do that before it becomes annoyingly uh, painful or irritating. Uh, a few seconds? a few minutes if you're going fast on the highway. So flight at super speed is going to be that. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Eviscerate, who says a little bit more about the restrictions we'd actually be facing if we had to take the rest of society and the way that we fly and regulate flying into account. They say that flying using our eyes like Superman and not instruments like Iron Man means that we would be flying under visual flight rules, or VFR. Flying under VFR means that we wouldn't need to file a flight plan or ask for clearance from the FAA as long as we don't fly into restricted airspace. If you were to fly on a clear day in a non-restricted airspace and not enter international airspace, you would not be required to even contact the FAA, let alone file a flight plan. Many countries allow VFR flight at night. So the lessons here are to keep your flight at a reasonable altitude, to keep it around highway speeds, to stay out of restricted or international airspace, and you should be just fine. Thank you again for a great and entertaining show, Eviscerate. Oh, do, how do I pronounce that? Eviscerate. Thank you. Eviscerate, those were some great points and they are well taken. I think that even if you don't have to file a flight plan or contact the FAA, there's still a lot of hassle uh, that mimics regular air travel that you could do even better in a plane, but I agree that your points are good ones. And for that, Eviscerate, you are indeed a super nerd. Oh, tiny!
Oh, it's so small. <coughs> now, if you are already subscribed to Alpha, which you can do at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is going to be because you saw this guy two days earlier than anyone else. Uh, lucky you, and you saw other premium content from myself, Nerdist, and Geek and Sundry. But if you haven't subscribed to Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science is... How dang... How dangerous are Gambit's playing cards, really? Yeah. That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we're trying to figure out just how dangerous Gambit's cards would really be if we could really evaluate how much potential energy he could get from something like a playing card and convert it into kinetic energy. Canonically, that's what he is doing, and canonically, his playing cards are charged with the energy of a hand grenade. But if we can analyze them in the right way, would they have the energy of a hand grenade? And can we make them even more dangerous with science? Ooh. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science. If you haven't yet, leave me all your best and nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. Click around here, you can't click it. Type it into your browser. And don't forget, when life shuts a door, you're trapped in that room now.